Hoeveel minuten hebben wij nog, Iris? Beginnen? Zijn we live? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well all the way in the back? Can you understand me well? Yeah? Is the volume right? Perfect. Welcome. Take a seat. Welcome. We're closing the doors of the aula. Um, yeah, so welcome tonight. My name is Tessa de Vries. I'm a programmer at Studium Generale, the platform for knowledge and reflection of Utrecht University. And um, yeah, tonight you're here for our final lecture in our series, The Future of Our Food. And we've developed this series together with the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development and Future Food Utrecht. And uh, before I introduce the lecture further, also welcome to everybody who's watching online. If you have a question, please type it down in our live chat. And uh, my colleague Anne-Marie will uh, send them to me and I can incorporate it in the Q&A session after the lecture. And if you are online right now, please subscribe, give a thumbs up. That really helps to spread our videos and we really appreciate it. Um, so I said it already. It's the final lecture in our series, The Future of Our Food. And I think we discovered the past weeks that our current global food system is insufficient. It's destroying the planet. It leads to loss of in biodiversity. It's highly vulnerable to increasingly frequent extreme weather due to global warming. Um, but moreover, it's deeply unfair. So although we produce enough food to feed the world, it is not distributed evenly and in many places People don't have access to healthy and fresh food. Um, so tonight in the closing lecture of this series, we broaden our perspective again. And we focus on the question, what do we need for a just and inclusive food system for everyone who is living on this earth? Um, so our guest of tonight, according to her, it's uh, time for change. She is an assistant professor of transformative governance and democracy at the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development at Utrecht University. So please give a very warm round of applause for Dr. Julia Chiazzi. Yeah, thank you so much for this very kind introduction. I'm very, very pleased and honored to be here to give this, this final uh, lecture of, um, yeah, of the Studium Generale, um, also on, uh, which focused a lot on food. My name yeah, is, is Julia Czersich. Um, as was said already, I'm um, working at the Copernicus Institute for Sustainable Development in the Environmental Governance Group. And previously, I was working a lot on commons approaches in, in seeds. And uh, I'm looking at the governance, governance issues of transitions, of transformations, especially in the food sector and especially with regard to justice and um, questions of democracy. And that's also what this lecture will be about um, today. I want to start this lecture with a number, 828. And I, want to like, I would like to ask you, what, what does that number stand for? You can just shout it uh, out, uh, or also those people joining online, um, please put your answer in the chat. No. Yeah. Uh, that goes in the right direction, yeah. So we had, uh, so we had waste before. The second part was on access, those that have not access to food. Yeah. So it's actually 828 million. And it's the number of people that were facing hunger um, in 2021. While hunger has been, uh, it, it has been possible uh, to decrease hunger over quite some centuries in the last uh, years, uh, since 2014, we see that hunger is again on the rise. And this trend has been uh, increased even more um, by the recent crisis um, in, in the Ukraine, um, but yeah, also the, COVID, also the COVID crisis. But it's not just linked to this crisis, but um, it's caused by issues that run throughout the food system. Um, very deeply and that are just uh, brought out even more um, through these recent crises. So that's what I want to explore uh, in, this, in this lecture. Um, why are we still having 828 million people on the planet that don't have sufficient food 
available. You, we already, or you already heard this in, in previous lectures, um, in, in previous phases where there was a lot of hunger or inse food insecurity, um, a strategy of agricultural cultural intensification was pursued. Um, since the early, early 20th century, um, with the introduction of um, new, new types of varieties based on um, progress in, in breeding in terms of developing varieties that have higher harvests, um, but also embedded in an agricultural system that very much relies on high imp inputs of pesticides, um, a lot of, a lot of nu nutrition as well, um, fertilizers, um, and that is very much focused on uh, uh, cultivation of agriculture and monocultures. So as you see on these pictures, uh, on, on large fields, so you have also have varieties that are, that are adapted to this purpose, so they're quite uniform. Um, in scope, so they can be cultivated on, on in broad areas. So this has uh, this answer to food to, to food insecurity um, was very much based on production. So uh, around the narrative of feed the world or sustainable intensification. So narratives that uh, say that the problem lies that it lies in not having enough food produced rather than looking at issues, for instance, of distribution. So it doesn't ask the question of who, but just of what. Uh, and the, uh, the assumption in, uh, in these discourses is um, that as long as we in, uh, increase, as long as we grow, as long as we grow, um, states can just redistribute, basically. Um, and that's a paradigm that I want to highlight um, that is not just prevalent in food, but in general, in general in our societies, and is one of the central drivers of um, the the injustice, the inequalities, and also the unsustainability of the system that we are living in. I want to continue with a quote, uh, and I would like to ask you to, to tell me who said this, um, or whose statement is this. Contributing to sustainable development is a core element of our strategy and our core values. Guided by our vision, health for all, hunger for none. We promote inclusive growth and a responsible use of resources to help people and planet thrive. Who could have said this? Could you repeat? Ah, okay, that's, yeah, Dalai Lama, that's one way to go. Other ideas? Okay, Kate Raworth. Okay, other ideas? You're all wrong. <laughs> hmm? Gandhi, no, it also wasn't Gandhi. But it very well illustrates uh, what the companies today are doing. So there's actually a quote by Bayer. So you might know Bayer uh, recently fusioned with Monsanto. So it really shows the kind of narratives that are being used and shows the politics uh, in these discourses. So it says, um, there are a few hints though in the statement. So it's very much aimed at sustainability, of course, but a few hints that it's not from, yeah, Gandhi, for instance. <laughs> um, it says we promote inclusive growth. Um, so that's, that's one sign. Um, so when you look at statements, for instance, from Via Campesina, so these actors that are more thriving, are more pushing for, uh, well, food serenity, I will go into that more later on, um, you see that, yeah, they usually use different, different types of narratives. But it's, but this is kind of what, uh, um, one of, what one of the challenges is. So this whole discourse around sustainability and sensification is very much under the narrative of sustainability. But you really have to look at what are actually the consequences of this. And I want to today point to another side of the system. Um, and that is um, the effect that this, what's also called green revolution, so that's another narrative approach, um, the consequences that this approach has had uh, on in informal structures on, from perspective of justice around the world, especially in countries of the global south. Um, so what went along with this green revolution was also that more and more legislation was introduced. Um, so laws that um, prescribe what kind of varieties could be put on the market, so could be used in a commercial manner, or for instance, for cultivation 
uh, yeah, in agriculture. Um, and the result of this was um, that so they were very strict on, on uniformity, so every variety kind of has to have the same characteristics, every, in, as every individual of a variety has to be the same. And that's not usually the case with the kind of varieties that are being used in informal seed systems. So one of their strengths indeed is their heterogeneity. Um, so by introducing these laws uh, in systems uh, of, of the Global South where these informal seed systems are prevalent, um, it, it meant that a lot of seeds cannot be used anymore. And that's an ongoing trend. So it, it started uh, it started in the 20s, especially in Europe, and it's spreading more and more. Another aspect that I think a lot of people are more aware of, perhaps, is um, the issue of patents. Um, so that along with all the technological in, um, developments that we've seen, it has also um, created an entryway for big companies to treat seeds, treat plants, uh, as something that they could own as a commodity. So it really focuses on um, seeds or varieties as, as a commodity, rather than looking at their more intrinsic nature. Um, yeah, and um, it, this has created like a huge patent system um, that makes it harder and harder to, to freely access seeds uh, in, in more... Um, so, so seeds usually or traditionally were shared among farmers further developed. Um, but with, newer, um, with, with these developments, um, access is becoming more and more harder. And it's also, it's also an issue of land. So land is also something that is um, um, not, often not available. Uh, so th those means of production that are fundamental, especially for informal seed system for farmers that rely on, on, on these means of production, are being taken away through this um, formalization of, of the seed system that is not only created additionally, but is actually out being or to what extent outlawed. And it is quite, um, also quite shocking because, um, yeah, seeds traditionally, it's been really easy to reproduce them. Um, it's really difficult actually to create a commodity. So it's really very strongly link linked to the governance system that is behind it. And the, the, the kind of varieties or the, the, cult, yeah, the cultural varieties that we're using today, like tomatoes, for instance, they've been developed over century, centuries by farmers through these informal seed systems. So it's also, yeah, um, now on the last final step, putting a patent on it or variety protection, um, which is kind of an adapted patent, um, is yeah, also unfair from this perspective, looking at the heritage of these seeds. Uh, yeah, this whole system has lost to, uh, led to um, an immense loss uh, of the plant genetic diversity that we, that we have, that we used to have. Um, of the 30,000 edible plant species um, that, that are available on the planet, only about 150 of them are being cultivated today. Also, when we look uh, at the global production of, of crops, so it's like f it's four crops, four species that are dominant, it's, 50, uh, it's basically four, yeah, four, four crops um, that uh, make up half of the, the food uh, that, that we eat. Um, that's sugarcane, which is something that's also used a lot, um, or all of these are actually also not only used for, for, for um, consumption, but also for its feed. So sugarcane, uh, maize, wheat and rice are the, like the four crops that are mainly cultivated. And even within those, um, those few species, there are a very limited number of varieties. So this makes the system very, um, not very resilient uh, in terms of uh, the environmental changes that we are seeing. And it's very much linked to this. So what you see here is um, an immense consolidation in the food market, especially in the seed market. Um, as I said before, um, it's quite astonishing that seed is so much treated as a commodity because traditionally it wasn't even, even able, possible to make it a commodity because it can be reproduced so easily. Um, but now we see that four firms um, are controlling about 50% of the world's seed market and about 62% of pesticides. So what, what is an interesting factor here as well is um, it's the same companies that control both the seed seeds as well as the agrochemicals. So this shows this link. Um, 
seeds are being developed to be cultivated um, with, a high in, with high input of pesticides um, and other supportive um, chem agrochemicals. Um, and yeah, that's, that's a major problem, of course, um, because they are the foundation of our food system. And, but you don't just see it with seeds, you also see it, for instance, uh, with farm machineries, you also see it with a farmer, and more recently with, with the growing um, plant-based meat products, you also see this kind of co consolidation. Um, so it is a massive problem um, that, as we all know, um, this whole system of very limited number of varieties produced with high inputs have created uh, massive environmental uh, challenges, pushing our planetary boundaries beyond safe operating spaces. I will not go into detail here because you covered this in other lectures, um, but just to highlight it once more. Um, and I think one of, one of the central issues, of course, is also the loss of genetic diversity, which is often doesn't receive so much attention. Um, so there's a lot of focus on climate change, of course, but not so much uh, on, on the loss of biodiversity, which is essential to react to climate change. And we are already seeing the effects today. Um, so the climate is already massively changing. Uh, we have more and more disasters. And these hit especially those that are already most vulnerable. So these um, changes that we are seeing are also not evenly distributed. Um, so they are made uh, to a large extent caused by the global north, but they're affecting global south um, the strongest. So this, and this is aggravated even more by the loss in genetic diversity because um, when you have a very uh, homogeneous variety, it's not able to um, adapt as well to changing climate conditions. So what farmers used to do um, is grow a lot of different, different varieties, um, so what, what's also called populations. And then if you have a pest, it might kill part of the harvest. So you usually don't have as high harvests but you have a safe harvest, so you can always feed your family with it. What happens now if you have very uniform um, varieties, they perform really, really well if everything goes well. So uh, as long as you have like, a lot of inputs, um, uh, if there are no, no unexpected um, disasters, they perform really well, um, and that's also what the numbers show. So all the advancements, advancements that we have seen in, in agriculture, they have, of course, had a, had a valuable effect. They have contributed um, to com combating hunger in a lot of countries. But especially with the changing environmental conditions, they are not sufficient anymore. Um, and also the technologies, they, they tend to focus on like very specific genes, for instance, uh, also adapting for, to a specific pest or, for instance, making, making a variety more resilient or more resistance um, to, to growing water, but that's usually focused on this specific aspect of it. And if something else happens, some, something unexpected, it doesn't work anymore. And that's, that's the big issues. So these uh, kind of varieties, they form, perform really well for conditions of the global north. So for industrialized monocultures where you can really well control the conditions. But I mean, even here we are seeing that uh, it's, it's causing a lot of problems, but especially for countries such as the Philippines where you constantly have floods, uh, you have a lot of storms, um, it usually doesn't work as well. And another aspect uh, that is linked to, to what I said previously with regards to also the patents and also this um, consolidation of both seed companies and agrochemical companies is um, that uh, buying new seeds, so with these kind of seeds that are sold on the, or with the modern varieties, you need to buy new seeds every year because the, the reprodu reproduction of these seeds is limited through several means. So it could be um, biotechnical means, for instance, when you use hybrid seeds, which are, um, I think it was explained last in the last lecture what hybrid seeds are. So basically uh, you cross two inbred lines, um, then in the first generation you have a very, um, uh, uh, you, have a, you, have a, uh, you have a variety with a very high uh, harvest, but if you reproduce it again, um, the individuals from this species will just fall apart, so you, you cannot really reproduce it anymore. Um, another way to, uh, to go is, uh, yeah, of course, with patents. So if you, if you use genetic engineering, for instance, or these moder more modern um, technologies, they're usually linked to patents, so it's not allowed for farmers to reproduce. So farmers need to buy these seeds again every single year. 
Um, so that's a cost factor. Um, what happened in the green revolutions in a, lo a lot of countries is um, that uh, companies came in, offered their seats, uh, which with the promise of it being a lot more productive, which it was for the first few years, um, but exploiting, uh, exploiting the soil, putting a lot of uh, pes uh, pesticide, uh, pesticides uh, in as well uh, to make them work, because these kind of varieties are developed um, for conventional agriculture and they are not developed for an organic agriculture, which we also need uh, if you want to move on. So there's very, very few varieties that are actually developed um, for organic ag agriculture. Um, yeah, but I think the biggest problem with these of the technologies is, is just it doesn't really consider justice aspects of it, the access to these seeds um, and uh, the, the debts that are created, especially by small-scale farmers in the global south, or to them, not by them. Yeah, uh, another aspect I want to highlight with regards to like the problems in the system is that we're seeing a disconnection of humans from food systems, um, so that a lot of people just don't know where their food is coming from anymore. Um, of course, well, uh, there's fast food, um, where you barely see what, what this food is about at, at all. Um, but you also see pictures that might be closer to those in the room, or may, ho hopefully not, but <laughs> we see them every time we go into a supermarket. Uh, so especially in the Netherlands, a lot of plastics. Uh, and another aspect is that, of course, these kind of um, fruits, so that's strawberries, um, they're sold all year round, or maybe closer to home, tomatoes. Uh, and we don't see the effects anymore. So we buy them here, uh, but the, the effects are elsewhere, so we don't really think about them anymore. And that's also a question of justice. Um, so it's a disconnect in spatial, times, uh, in spatial terms, but also in temporal terms, so that we can just consume any food we want any time we want without looking at the consequences. And it's also a question of control of n humans over nature, so that the idea uh, that we have these varieties, uh, that we have these seeds, and we can just temper with them, that we can control them um, by creating quite artificial systems. We have these more modern technologies as well, um, where we don't even need soil anymore to grow food. Um, so I would say that's also a central driver of um, a lot of the problems that we have in the current seed system. So, when we talk about just transition, having heard all that, um, I would like to ask you, actually, um, what do you think, what, what does just food transition mean to you, or what does justice mean in the context of a food transition? So, you can go to menti.com, uh, enter the code that you see on the screen. I also invite those joining online. It's, it's also on your slide there, so. Okay, so the code is then also up there. Okay, so we are already, I might have shaped, <laughs> shaped the discussion a little bit already, but uh, yeah, we all see some uh, words coming in. So access is there, fair prices, fair distribution, healthy food, that's really important as well, true pricing. Harmony with nature, Except equal distribution, autonomy. Yeah, okay, really, really good. Um, so I think a lot of a lot of important aspects. Um, so it's about distribution. It's about access. I also like um, that you brought up the uh, um, or someone brought up the uh, the aspect of connection to nature because um, that's an understanding of justice that's 
usually not very prevalent in the global north, so that's coming more from a global south perspective. You can go back to the slides. Yeah, and uh, the issue of, uh, of health, that's, uh, uh, I forgot to mention that, uh, so that's also really an important aspect. Um, so um, when we look at these, these hunger statistics um, that, that we saw, saw earlier, um, so um, insufficient access to food, that's usually a problem um, in the global south, especially like in, in Asia with the most number of people being affected, and in Africa with the strongest prevalence. Uh, of, uh, of hunger, um, and uh, but it's not just an issue of the global uh, global south um, because of course malnutrition and obes obesity is also a huge problem in Europe and uh, and especially um, the United States of America. So um, that's that's another I I aspect of of justice and of inequality that's also of course present um, in global countries of the global no north. So very important to consider, not just across uh, countries, but also within countries, the, the inequalities that we are seeing. So um, when we talk about justice, there are different conceptions of justice, of course. Um, it's, a concept, context, uh, it's a concept that is contested. So one thing that's often equa uh, equated with justice or um, put in context with co uh, justice is the, the aspect of equality, so that everyone should be treated the same, but that doesn't really consider um, that people come from different uh, different backgrounds, have different needs. That's what equity looks at. Um, so different, uh, giving people according to their to their needs, basically. Uh, and then uh, you could also say justice uh, is different from both. I mean, it's connected to both, but it's also different uh, because it also means um, appreciating the differences and not adjusting how pe people respond to the system, but rather changing the system as such. This also means that justice can take different meanings across society. So it's not a, co a concept that I would say uh, is the same for everybody, but should also be put in, in, into empirical context. I already pointed to some of the narratives that are dominant in the current system. And by looking at yeah, what, what is wrong, in the current system, we can also look at uh, what needs to change. And uh, I want to argue that there are three underlying paradigms that keep the current system stuck in its dynamics, basically, and that we have to shift um, to, to alternative uh, ways of, of, of doing things. Uh, and in the food system, um, I think there are already yeah, quite good alternatives emerging. Um, so we've seen uh, that the food system is very much focused on productivism and growth, which has created a lot of the environmental problems that we have. Um, but also by looking only at, at growth, um, it also disregards other aspects of justice, as you already said, <laughs> with distribution, for instance, or access. The second is um, the, the question of control of humans over nature or disconnection from nature, because it means that we don't really experience the problems that are there anymore because they're so far, far away. Um, and it's also a question of justice with regard um, to non-human actors that are often not present in these discussions at all, especially in the food system. Uh, and then the third aspect is moving from expert technocratic knowledge to more pluralist perspectives. So this whole formal food system is very much focused on, on knowledge that has been created in universities, that is very Western-centric, very much focused also on more natural science perspectives, which also shows um, why, or might be an indicator also why, why like the power dynamics, for instance, are often not considered as much. So while a technology might have positive effects per se, um, if you don't consider the governance system it is embedded in, um, it, it can still have very, very unjust effects. And I think that's, that's what I want to highlight. So it's not condemning a certain technology, but it is um, the need to look at the governance system around it and what effects it has. I also want to emphasize that justice is multidimensional. So in most discussions, justice, uh, is, fo justice is focused on distributive justice, um, which is, of course, of course, a very important aspect. Um, this is also the, the kind of change we've been seeing in the, in the d debate around food systems. So originally, we had the idea of food security, um, which yeah, initially was basically we just need to produce more food, and then governments can take care of it, basically. Um, that's how we deal with hunger. 
then the next step, it, it kind of moved on um, to saying, okay, it's not just about the level of production, but it's also about distribution. So that was kind of the next step. Um, and yeah, more and more uh, other ideas uh, uh, are coming in there as well, such as, such as actual access, and there's more focus on um, questions such as food sovereignty, so not just access to food itself, but also access to the means of production. And that's shif shifting the discourse. And that uh, links uh, to another important aspect of justice, and this is, re this is uh, recognition justice. Uh, so what, uh, whose voices are considered in this system? Um, so it's a question of rights, and that's also what makes food sovereignty a strong concept, because it's often also linked to rights. And uh, right to food is kind of the third, <laughs> third part of the wheels of food security, food sovereignty, and also rights to food. And I think uh, when looking at them complementary, they can be really helpful. Um, so it's recognizing also different, different um, forms of knowledge, bringing in traditional indigenous perspectives that are often uh, disregarded in this discourse. Um, and then this links, of course, to procedural justice. How do we make sure that these voices are heard, that they are systematically considered uh, in the governance system, that these people actually have a voice, uh, and not just have a voice, but that their voice are matter, and that they um, translate into decisions that are being made. And another aspect that I think is often, or is, is least regarded, is the aspect of restorative justice. So we have a lot of injustices also from a historical perspective. Um, and restorative justice aims to, to highlight that. Um, that we also need to think about how can we make up for the damages that have already been created. From a historical matter, um, but it also, another strength of it, it also brings in the, um, the aspect of non-human actors. While it can, of course, also be considered distributive justice or recognition justice or procedural justice, um, restor restorative justice really brings this out um, that we need to consider this as, as, as well. So moving beyond these narratives of productivism and growth that, that I've tried to highlight in the first part of the lecture, uh, I want to point to those initiatives that are already living the change that we need to see in the world, as I would, would call it. Um, so they're moving more towards narratives, and not just narratives, but also the systems that stand behind it um, of food sovereignty uh, and agroecology. So food sovereignty, um, I already pointed at it, is, is basically access um, to, to the means of producing food. So um, looking at who controls for instance, seeds, but also land, um, other means of production. Uh, so it's an empowerment, um, it's a movement, it's much more a political statement. So food sovereignty uh, is a quite technical term, at least historically. And uh, food sovereignty is a concept that was brought forward by food movements. So for instance, Via Campesina, that are, are really trying um, to, to make peasant voices heard. And peasant here is, is meant in a very strong manner. So it's, 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 it's about a fight, basically. Um, fight for their rights, uh, fight for their voices being heard, for their knowledge being considered, um, for not disregarding the, um, also the, yeah, the knowledge that is also linked to the material aspects, for instance, of seeds. Um, yeah, so this is, very, this is a very important concept, and agroecology, um, which can be understood at, at different levels, but um, it, it, can also, it can be seen as also a political movement uh, that aims for a fundam fundamental transformation of current food systems. When you look at discussions, for instance, of the World Food uh, Forum, they will of often talk uh, of uh, food or agri-food transitions, um, but when you hear agroecology, um, it usually is also linked to these types of actors, movements that are trying to make the change from the bottom up. Uh, and then when we, yeah, there are a lot of initiatives that are already implementing this, especially, so agroecology especially is strong in the Global South. And it's not just, it, it, it tries to recognize, again, um, more traditional forms uh, of, of, of cultivation, an integrated agriculture based on organic uh, principles of production, also uh, creating, um, oh, sorry, also um, creating, um, mutual, um, yeah, basically making the system work, work as a whole, uh, so not looking at, uh, at different varieties separately from another, but 
creating a system that's mutually reinforcing, basically. Um, and uh, yeah, this is also already being practiced. Um, some initiatives um, that are, I would like to highlight in this context um, that are both present in the Global North as well as the Global South are, for instance, community-supported agricultures, um, so that are all, all also trying to bridge the gap between um, the, the urban space and the rural space. Um, but this very well connects to the second um, important uh, paradigm or shift that we need, I would argue, and that is reconnecting humans and uh, non-human relationships. By initiatives, um, for uh, such as community-supported agriculture, um, you bring um, consumers and producers of food closer to one another. Um, also, consumers understand the struggles of being farmer, for instance. Um, they get to experience cultivation on the field. Um, so the idea basically, basically is um, that um, you have a community uh, of, of consumers um, that at the, at the beginning of, of, the, of a harvest season already buy a share basically of the produce that will come out from, from one farmer or group of farmers. Um, and then this share of or this harvest is shared equally among them. And when there's for instance, um, yeah, when the harvest is not as good as expected, this, 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 this risk is shared evenly across the consumers. But also if you have a really good harvest, uh, everyone gets a little bit more. Uh, so it, it gives a security to the farmers um, and uh, um, they are fi financially more, more um, covered uh, in case something goes wrong. Um, but as I said, it also um, is really attractive, I would say, especially for instance for families, uh, because like uh, as you see also on, on this picture, um, yeah, children for instance get to experience where actually our food is coming from. And another aspect that's also or initiative that's also quite prevalent, especially which you also already see in Utrecht here. So Utrecht Natürlich um, is, an, is an initiative that. Uh, has kind of has built a network of community gardens uh, in Utrecht where you can just go. Um, so some are really open, and for some you you, you kind of become a member, um, and then you can participate in the garden uh, and just go there anytime. And it makes the city greener. It brings people closer to nature. Um, yeah, and it just has a lot of uh, good aspect also in, in forms of um, com creating community relational values that are often disregarded uh, in the former system. Yeah, and this I already mentioned a little bit, bringing in pure perspective and understandings of knowledge, I would say, is really important as well. Um, so combining the, the knowledge that we have from, from our scientific system, I mean, there is a lot of important knowledge that we have, but combining it and seeing it on the same level with more traditional approach, approaches, um, there's a lot of implicit knowledge, um, especially in agriculture, that is lost in the current system. It just doesn't account for it. Uh, and um, in, in the upper, upper right corner, um, for instance, you see Mazipak, that's a Philippine rice uh, farmer breeder network. Um, and they emerged in response to the Queen Revolution in the Philippines. So as I said previously, uh, in the, during the Queen Revolution, a lot of the traditional seed was lost uh, and a lot of farmers got indebted um, and they, brought together a lot of farmers, uh, harvest or brought together the traditional seeds uh, that were still out there, and also developed them further in a participatory manner, bringing together scientists as well as farmers, as well as breeders, so that farmers would also learn more about the breeding process, breeders would understand more what the needs of farmers are. So they are they're actually now always talking of farmer breeders because they want to highlight that all of them that develop these new varieties as well, um, that they are actually both farmers and breeders at the same time. Um, and they've created a really strong network. So they are now about 30,000 uh, farmer families um, that collectively share these seeds, also create um, a form of insurance. So one of the challenges is also if your the varieties that you're growing, if they're not, if they don't fit in the current system, so you cannot certify them officially, they also don't qualify, at least in the Philippines, they also don't qualify uh, for insurance. Uh, so uh, if the harvest is lost, what hap which happens quite a lot in the Philippines, um, yeah, everything is gone and you also don't have seeds to reproduce. So they have like a community insurance system. 
So every year from the harvest, they give a smaller, small percentage of, of, the, um, of the seeds to community bank. And if there is a disaster, they can also they can get new new seeds from the, from this bank. So they've created community structures that cover the parts of the system basically that are not working for them uh, in this in this very formalized system. Yeah. Um, now another aspect is also um, it has to do with recognition justice. Uh, so recognizing uh, different approaches to well-being, which are often oh, sorry, which are often strongly linked then to um, to agriculture. So when we veer, for instance, is a kind of concept that comes from from Ecuador, uh, which also highlights this this intrinsic nature uh, element of nature. Um, so. What you have to, or what you, what's important to understand is that these these paradigms are also strongly interlinked, as you as you notice when I explain them. I uh, always also refer them to the others. So when we view, for instance, also um, is very much about seeing nature as an intrinsic value. So they uh, in Ecuador they speak of Pachamama, uh, so our mother earth, basically, um, and this is then also reflected in how um, seeds are being treated. Mazipak also, for instance, in the Philippines, they speak of seeds not as a commodity, but, but um, as a sacred good. So commercializing uh, seeds, also like uh, the seeds of rice, would be unthinkable for them. With vegetables, it's okay, <laughs> but with rice, it's very, <laughs> it's very difficult for them. Uh, but it's not just in the Global South. For instance, we also worked together in, in the previous project I was in. We worked together with Kultursaat. That's uh, a German organic um, breeder initiative. And they, um, that's quite interesting because they actually develop organic varieties in an organic matter for professional organic agriculture, so for the German context. So it shows that this approach also can work in the global north uh, for formalized system, even though it is difficult, um, that's for sure. And they have a really small percentage, of course, uh, in, in, in terms of um, like total, total amounts of seeds that are being used. But they do show it is also possible um, in the current system, um, in the formal system. Um, so they develop varieties that are not protected by variety protection, which is very uncommon to do. Um, yeah, and they also consider seeds as a cultural good. Uh, so, so they also, also uh, highlight this heritage aspect of seeds. Yeah, um, so what I want to... Um, what, I, what, I, what I've tried to highlight with this presentation, I think it's clear to everybody, everybody in this whole series that a fundamental transformation is needed in the food system, and not just in the food system, basically everywhere, but uh, we focus on the food system, of course, here. Um, and for this, it is not sufficient to have uh, technocratic small fixes here and there. We need a fundamental transformation that looks at power dynamics, that no looks at how knowledge is created, that looks at the underlying narratives that are being promoted and the connected belief system. Also questions what kind of interests lie, lie behind these narratives, because as we saw with the example of Monsanto, often they sound quite good, but when you really go into it and, and check what are they actually doing, um, you see the problems that are arising. I want to call for diverse and locally adapted pathways. We don't, it's, we live in a very complex system, as, as was highlighted uh, in, for, by some of my colleagues, very complex food system, and it's, we don't have the luxury of it, or it's, it's just not possible to have one solution that works everywhere. We need adapted pathways. As I said earlier, in, in the global south, in, in, where in, in some contexts, um, it works well to have uh, have have, or have a specific have a specific variety um, on a monoculture. In some context, context, it might it might least lead to the highest harvest, but in a lot of contexts, it doesn't work. Um, so we need quite, as I said, locally adapted pathways, diverse solutions that emerge from the bottom up, and most of all, we need a change of frame conditions. So without changing the institutions, we will not arrive at this. Uh, at this change. It's not sufficient to have new technologies introduced uh, because they do not challenge the fundamental underlying power dynamics uh, that we are seeing. So we need to democratize food governance um, at all levels, on a global level, uh, just as much as on a national level and local level, and we need to empower marginalized actors. 
What, I, what do I mean by me, by we? Of course, that's a different, <laughs> that's a difficult question. Um, of course, uh, a lot of this change that we're seeing is being pushed by the by, by movements, um, food movements that are connecting. Uh, so we see a lot of local solutions, but it doesn't stay on the local level. They are more and more connecting. They are more and more, more seeing what they have in common. So they acknowledge di the diversity, but also the similarities. Uh, so it's it's a process of, of building strong alliances, challenging dominating system. And I think science, for instance, can be can also be an actor that supports this process uh, in taking transformative research approach, for instance, or also education. Um, and at the same time, so this uh, bottom-up process, but we also need changes uh, top-down. So we also need changes, um, as I said, in global governance structures and in national. Uh, national legislation that allow um, for, this, for, this, for this diversity. So with this I want to conclude. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to the discussion and yeah, your questions. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Is my microphone on? Yeah, it is. Um, thank you, really, really interesting. I'm just curious, you talked about in your final slide about these adaptive pathways and also that our complex, our food system is so complex that there is not just one solution that works for everyone in this world. Do you, do you mean that this, these locally adapted pathways, the kind of we need different food system existing next to each other or how should I understand that? Yeah, um, I think there are some principles that can be shared. For instance, if you look at agroecology, it's very much focused or embedded in the, of the idea of resilience, and resilience is always about adaptation, basically. Uh, so a lot of different different sol solutions that can be quite different uh, next to each other, um, but also, as I said, some shared underlying principles uh, mm -hmm. such as also for instance taking also global thinking approach is important um, yeah uh, or uh, Can you give an example what is global thinking approach <laughs> yeah basically that you consider not just uh, if test and not just the effects that you that you have on a global level uh, yeah. but uh, on a local level but also on a global level so with these um, local experiments sometimes there are like trans local effects or so, so broader effects that we also need to con consider um, and of course there are there are also some tensions between different aspects of of justice um, so uh, I mean maybe maybe we we'll, we have some questions before I go into this more um, but but basically so for instance distributive justice um, yeah. A distributive, um, or, or no, let's take another example: recognition justice, for instance. So, recognizing different, different understandings of, um, of of food systems, of values, and so on, um, could mean um, also that uh, traditional hunting, for instance, is encouraged, um, such as, for instance, whales in an in extreme case. Mm -hmm. um, so, how do we reconcile this? Um, with, with a restorative justice aspect, for instance, of protecting uh, also maybe the rights of these, uh, these animals or um, the larger effect that taking out such uh, like huge animals out of the system has on a wider system. So this is system, this, these are um, tensions between justice aspects that we also need to consider and I also don't have a, have a perfect answer for that. It's, it's complicated. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, have a first question from our, our online audience. Uh, it's a question of Francis, uh, and he's asking whose voices are the most important when it comes to creating a just food transition? So whose voices are the most important? Yeah, I, I guess that links a little bit to the question or to what I just yeah. just explained. Um, but I would say, yeah, the, those that are currently marginalized are important to highlight. Um, because they haven't had the chance uh, to voice um, their opinions. But in general, I mean, it should be a more democratic process that considers uh, different needs, different perspectives in a more consensual manner. So it also doesn't mean like taking individual perspectives and uh, yeah, uh, valuing them, them about uh, over everybody else. Um, yeah, but looking at the current interests, this is how we can tackle them. Um, 
yeah. And uh, if we look at more local, I think if we look at more local solutions, it's also easier to to recon reconcile um, different different actors uh, in that specific context. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I also think we need coordination on a broader level. So, for instance, policy uh, centric governance system, so that you have uh, like locally. Um, quite independent structures, basically independent actors that can develop adapted solutions, but you also have a form of coordination, for instance, on overarching, uh, overarching values or directions or goals that you want to take. Yeah, so, so you say, uh, or no, you say I'm gonna try to, <laughs> to wrap it all together, but I, I'm sure I can, but another question then maybe, um, you talk about these all these t different uh, forms of justice, these paradigm shifts that which are needed. How, and we just discussed how, whose voices are most important to hear in this food transition. You say the ones that are most marginalized. How can we make mm -hmm. sure that these voices are being heard and that we are forcing these important values um, uh, to be implemented in our governance systems? So how can we make sure this is all happening? Yeah, for instance, by changing uh, procedures, so that links to yeah. procedural justice. Um, maybe maybe one example um, with the recent UN Food, uh, Global UN Food System Summit. Um, that was a summit that was uh, organized mainly by, by private actors, so it was kind of taken out of the typical uh, structures. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, for instance, the FAO, um, uh, uh, World, World Food um, Council, so um, those, those global actors that they have established procedures of how to include different voices and they were not really included in the, in the procedure of setting up these summits. And while there was a lot of talk about including a lot of different voices, I think uh, in a, so at the end thousands of people participated and, and, uh, and gave their opinions, gave their statements. Uh, but it wasn't transparent how these um, how these voices then actually affected the kind of final document to, to the decision making process. Um, so I, this this is que questions of democracy. How do you organize it, uh, especially on a global level? And mm -hmm. that's I think where we we still have a lot of um, work to do. Uh, yeah. And work to do is what, what what do you do to make sure these voices are heard besides? Your scientific, like your research and stuff, is it? Do you go into the streets to demonstrate, or <laughs> um, what can we do as people in the audience besides studying your field of research? Yeah, uh, I think probably everyone has to kind of to this. There, I think there are a lot of different strategies that can be taken and that have value, and everyone kind of needs to find their own pathway. Um, for me, um, what I try to do in my research is um, give voice to actors that are already showing that things can be done differently. So for instance, these, uh, what we call the seed commons initiatives um, mm -hmm. that are already living the change, but can also be framed as real utopias. Um, so utopia or real utopia in a very positive sense. So they're bringing visions of the future into the here and now and showing that they work. Uh, and it, it can be quite successful. Mm -hmm. um, so in the Philippines, for instance, or also in a lot of other countries, there's the system of participatory guarantee system. Um, so the um, uh, organic certification that is traditionally, traditionally used um, is bar based on par uh, third party certification. So that can be very expensive, especially for smallholder farmers. And there's this alternative system um, yeah, that takes a participatory approach. So farmers kind of um, uh, con or certify one, in, one another um, whether they fulfill these standards. And often these standards are a lot higher than uh, in, the, in the third party system. Um, and this approach uh, was, was tested by, so Mazipak, the, the, the initiative I mentioned earlier, um, uh, in, in, in their own well, not local because they operate all across the Philippines, but um, like within their initiative, and then they showed, okay, it is working. It is working with 30,000 farmers, basically. Um, maybe not everybody can uh, participate, but it is working. Then other initiatives or, or like NGOs, for instance, came and also implemented the system and or tried it out, learned from them. Uh, and now it's actually um, 
being adopted in uh, in the national organic law. So it's uh, it, it has been recognized now yeah, yeah. as an alternative system to the third party certification. So by showing us examples, showing that they work, I think it may also makes it easier yeah. for policymakers uh, to, to adopt these alternatives. Yeah, yeah. And that again it enables uh, these bottom up uh, alternative approaches. But yeah, yeah. it always needs front runners, and I think it needs combining um, showing that these local solutions work with activism. Um, so <laughs> nothing's gonna change by itself. We also no. need the force, basically. Uh, but I do think, uh, like, seeing maybe science also a little bit as an ally, uh, show, uh, like, also if you, it also gives a certain legitimation, legitimization to, to these initiatives um, from when you also show from a scientific perspective, of course, in a critical manner. Um, I mean, that's, that's always a bit the challenge with transdisciplinary research, of course. So if you work with stakeholders, um, they, uh, like the stakeholders, of course, or the initiatives you work with, they also need to be open to uh, um, constructive criticism, so also aspects that might not be working so well. So it, of course, uh, it, it shouldn't be like a blind, we support you. Um, but by reflecting on them critically with them together, um, it can also help to give them validation yeah. and improve. So because these initiatives are also about testing and experimenting and improving these alternatives. Yeah. yeah. Are there any questions in the audience for Julia? Yeah. In the front and the back afterwards. Hello, uh, Julia. I'm from the province of Utrecht. Uh, so in the first part, you, you told us about this, these four um, multinationals who are dominating the, 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 the food market and the seeds market. In the second part, you showed us that there are a lot of alternative groups working on new solutions. Uh, do you also already see also that this, these alternative groups are influencing these four uh, multinationals? Are they really changing their way of production? <laughs> uh, I don't think that's going to happen, <laughs> to be honest. I think it changes the way they frame things, maybe. Uh, I mean, it's also, I mean, shouldn't put everyone under the same, same, uh, or shouldn't read everyone um, in the same matters. For instance, Monsanto was famously known for, <laughs> for how, how bad they treated small farmers, so there were like a lot of court cases against, against small farmers. Uh, so, I mean, it's not the case with all of them. Um, but, but I think the change has to come from governance. I don't think these big multinational companies are going to change. I mean, they might make small adjustments, perhaps, uh, but they, they just have way, way too much power in this current system. They profit to it, from it too much. Uh, I, I don't think they will change anything fundamental. Um, I mean, that's, that's also a big risk, um, and that's also a question of strategy in, uh, in, in movements. Um, who you build alliances with um, because what we've seen historically, for instance, looking at uh, the organic agriculture movement, is that it's become very much co-opted um, by, uh, by, the, by these, uh, these other actors, um, which we also see now with, uh, with, as I briefly mentioned earlier, with the plant-based meat. Um, so, I mean, it's of course important to um, try to, to aim for less meat consumption, but what is happening and is that this alternative meat market is now dominated again uh, by these big corporations. And as, as long as we don't break apart these, um, yeah, these structures, um, it doesn't really change that much. And it's just an add-on. It's not really reducing. Uh, as we, I mean, meat consumption is not a problem, but it's it's not really reducing uh, these effects. It's the same the same with energy. Uh, of course, um, that oftentimes um, you have these alternative solutions that are being adopted, uh, but they're more an add-on and they don't really replace, replace the existing structures. Who was the other one with a question? Yeah, yeah what do you think of uh, these new technologies like vertical farming or enteric fermentation, uh, all this other stuff that are really far away from the connection to nature? but can be a really good solution, more sustainable, low emissions. So what do you think of that? Good question. Yeah, uh, it's also a difficult question. Um, I don't think I have a definite answer on that. I also haven't done an, enough research on that myself that I could really assess it very well. 
I do think it's dangerous and so forth that they play into these existing narratives. Um, and uh, there is, of course, with these types, so, so, so the point is um, with, with these narratives, with these paradigms, as long as you link to them, it's really, really easy to have these, uh, these alternatives co-opted by the current system because you're not, not challenging the underlying uh, power and economic structure. So it's still, if I use the term, still within the capitalist system. And I think there's the, that's the danger with these types of approaches. I mean, they, ha they, have, they have a potential, um, but only if the system around it is changed. And I don't think with these types of solutions that is going to happen. Um, so I'm not very optimistic with them. Um, but, uh, but yes, uh, as I said, I also haven't done research on it. So. But is it, do you think that they're also mainly pinpointed on, on making profits? Is that, is that the, the, the thing that's wrong with them? Or how should I understand it? I mean, yeah, it can be linked to that, but it's also like this idea that we can control nature that's very inherent in them, that you can create very artificial conditions. Um, and I mean, that's kind of how a lot of the current technologies that, or the technologies that are being used in agriculture started out. And with these kind of technologies there, you always see the same development. Um, so yeah, I'm, as I said, I'm quite critical with that. Uh, but it depends on the governance around it. Another question from online of Julian. You said earlier that people lost the connection to the origin of what they eat. How would we make people's interest in their nutrition again on a broader level? Yeah, I think it's by, by these practical examples uh, that I showed that they need to, like, I mean, I'm not saying that every, everybody needs to grow their own food, of course. <laughs> uh, I mean, we uh, can all specialize, and uh, I mean, that's also advantages of, of the current system, that not everybody needs to do everything. But I do think everyone should experience what food growing is like, at least for a certain amount of time. I mean, um, there's kind of this year in the German system, or it used to be like this, this voluntary year, where you spend some time at some social initiative uh, as like a replacement for being in the military. Um, and I think these kind of approaches would be good if you like m make people experience this at least for a little bit. Maybe it doesn't have to be a year, uh, or uh, like in community-supported agriculture that kind of um, gives gives people. I mean, it's in some communi uh, uh, CSA communities or community-supported agriculture communities, uh, you just you spend maybe you need to spend like three days or something a year working on the farm. So it doesn't have to be extensive, but I think we do need this connection also to understand what work is put into the food, which a lot of people don't. They don't know what it takes to, <laughs> to produce a tomato, for instance. Um, so I think, yeah, these, these practical experiences are extremely important. Other questions? Yes, over in the back. Hey. Um, my question was that, um, sorry, I've, I, I wrote it down. Um, how would you react to um, people that uh, think that food security really gets into danger when you like kind of stop to, yeah, like, try to scale down the big companies? Because I think that's what many people think nowadays, also with the war in Ukraine. Uh, that we have to produce more and more and more because otherwise there's not enough food, right? Is that what you mean? Yeah, uh, well, several answers to that. Uh, first one is that there, there, there's plenty of studies that show that this is not the case. I mean, okay, if you stopped it immediately, of course, that would create this problem. It's always if you ch change something really, really fa fast, uh, of course, then we would immediately uh, have, uh, as we don't, wouldn't have enough food for the moment. So, so this is, of course, true. So you need to make adjustments over time. But we have enough uh, studies that show, like with systems of agroecology, if you implemented them on a wider scale, that, that could feed the world population uh, at least the same at the end, probably much better. Um, we also need to see that the former seed market, so what I pointed out, that's the commercial market. Uh, so a lot of, like the majority of the human population is still reliant on informal food systems. So I, it's really difficult to get uh, reliable numbers on this, but there's estimations depending yeah, on a lot of different factors that say 
maybe 70, up to 70, 80, up to even 90% of the food that is consumed is actually comes from informal food systems. So it's not uh, like we are relying on the system uh, really. It's, uh, yeah, especially, especially in global, no, uh, global South, I guess in, in Europe, for instance, uh, we are more dependent on it. So here it would probably hit hardest actually. Um, yeah, uh, so it, it's a process and we cannot change it from one day to the other. Um, but I mean, we all also see what happens as soon as we have a crisis. Uh, and it's also not just in countries far away, like for instance, in Great Britain, there were empty shelves in supermarkets um, after, um, after Brexit, because yeah, you couldn't have uh, transporters going there anymore. So what do you do if, I have, if you have a crisis, if, uh, <laughs> if the transport system uh, breaks down, then a lot of people just don't have food anymore. So it's not like our current system is working so well. Another question. Uh, yeah, I have a question about what are your thoughts on uh, just for human rights, a universal declaration for uh, environmental rights, um, and or some other kind of viable way of like structuring a global governance uh, for a just food system. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. So you, you um, just like for human rights, uh, something uh, in, yeah, international that is beyond uh, beyond local governance uh, or beyond uh, beyond states, um, and but uh, then for environmental rights, uh, so like a universal declaration that uh, environmental uh, bodies or nature can get like uh, a legal a oh. legal okay. standpoint. So if I understand correctly, the question is basically how to change the governance, uh, uh, governance system to better represent the environment and also other actors. Um, um, so one aspect is actually kind of the implementation of what we already have um, and maybe also prioritizing some things over others. Uh, so for instance, in the, well, in the food system, well, it's very complex. Uh, um, but basically, we have different issue areas uh, in, in global food, food governance. Um, uh, so we have, for instance, the International Sea Treaty. Um, we have biodiversity, uh, the Biodiversity Convention. And they provide a lot of um, actually a strong or potentially strong rights, such, such as um, like to, uh, right, a right of farmers to reproduce their own seeds. Um, but uh, or the biodiversity convention that uh, has this norm of sustainable um, uh, conservation of, of genetic plant genetic resources um, or the seed treaty um, but on the other hand you have um, like international um, trade regimes you have private property regimes and they're usually kind of <laughs> when it comes down to it they're usually they have a stronger stronger means of implementation um, and they are also um, prioritized um, by a lot of governments um, so one thing would be to to strengthen these these um, kind of conventions that we already have, uh, enhancing the implementation, for instance, of the Nagoya Protocol um, or the International Sea Treaty, also on, a, on, also on a more global level, or rights of rights of indigenous people. There, we have a very strong international convention. And for instance, in the Philippines, uh, it's also actually an international law, but it's just not, it's n it's just not enforced. Um, so that, that's a big problem. Um, actually, there was a conference earlier today um, on ecocide. Um, so how to legally um, ma also make, make ecocide a crime. So basically um, massive destruction of the environment. Um, for instance, you could look at, uh, at in, in Lützerath in, in Germany, so the, the recent decision to destroy a village uh, to, to, to get more coal out of the ground um, could be considered an ecocide, for instance, I would at least argue so. Uh, so these are, these are ways I would say um, you could do it more legally. Um, there's also initiatives or examples that we already have. So, for instance, in Ecuador, Bolivia, uh, rights of nature are actually a part of the constitution. So that's also something we can learn, I think. Uh, and then, yeah, I think the big problem is make, make, making it enforceable. Um, so, yeah, ways of representing nature. Uh, I think that's also where still a lot more research is needed. Um, that's that's a very interesting way to go. But like for instance, um, like 
having, yeah, we were also like in one project um, that I'm involved in, uh, we were thinking of having like a, a mock trial, for instance, on ecocide, and then you could also experiment with how nature could be represented in such a trial. Um, for instance, uh, maybe specific actors that are linked to it uh, could, could represent it or, yeah, but um, that needs, I think that needs more research. More research and also maybe more recognition because it's happening already in other countries, right? Yes, yes, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Also learn from com countries of the Global South. I think there's a difficult dynamic uh, that we still have of this idea of development of like the Global North, bringing solutions to the Global South. And I think it's actually, we can learn a lot from one another. So we could, there's also a lot of good solutions that are already happening in the Global South. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if I'm understanding correctly, you're saying uh, governance has an important role in changing our food system to improve uh, justice, basically. Um, now, I think as we've seen in, in the past, governments trying to control certain markets and uh, food markets as, as well as can have a lot of unforeseen uh, consequences. I mean, look at the problem we're dealing now in the Netherlands with the farmers. Um, and as we live in a capitalist system, what can we do as consumers to uh, improve the justum in the global food system, basically? Yeah, I mean, there is, of course, the question of the like, consumer choice, like what you buy, of course, has an impact. Um, I'm not a fan of putting all the responsibility on the consumers because of all these power issues that we have. And uh, because that also, again, privileges those that are, have a higher income. But this is, of course, something uh, you can do, buy differently, and it doesn't have to be more expensive, not necessarily. So, for instance, if you join like a community-supported agriculture and you get get your food directly from a, from a farmer, uh, yeah, it, it might not be so much more expensive. Um, so I think these are ways to go, maybe also trying to get out of those market-based structures around food. I think that helps that because that takes power from the current system and builds these alternatives. And as I said, there are a lot of alternatives already out there. I think what we need to do is connect them more uh, so they re or we all realize how much power we do have to change the current system. In, in addition, a question from uh, Eline online is, how could we shift to a system that is more based on practices and perspectives from the global south if there is such a prevalence of Western ideas within the current food system? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> how do we do it? <laughs> yeah, as I how said, changing, changing the system. Um, also, like for instance, on a, on a global level, uh, it's also a question of representation in current, um, for instance, in the UN system. Um, it's, it's still kind of the, the same countries uh, had the most power like uh, during the Second World or after the Second World War uh, that are now have, have the strongest power in the international system still. So uh, changing something there um, is important um, in, in the global decision-making processes. Um, so for instance, uh, I, th I think in conventions like the Convention on Biodiversity, uh, you see this really well um, that, that you can try to bring in different actors that you have, can have much more open discussions. Um, there were some seed initiatives, for instance, that I worked with in the Philippines who were also uh, very much involved in these global processes uh, and uh, are taking influence there. So um, this is possible, of course. Um, yeah, just uh, I think just it needs a shift in, in, in mindsets and a mm -hmm. change kind of needs to happen everywhere. So. I always sometimes, sometimes also see the food system as an example because the paradigms that I pointed out that I pointed out they are not just prevalent in the food system; they are everywhere. When you look at the energy system, for instance, or yeah, any really any system, even in the, even in the scientific or in the ac academia, you see these paradigms. Um, so we need to change them everywhere and <laughs> every step it, we go. Mm. Basically, I think one aspect maybe is also that I haven't said yet is connecting, for instance, like the food movements to other types of movements, so to the, to the climate movement, to the broader environmental justice movement, um, yeah. It's kind of being aware in, that it can be done differently and then recognize these other yeah. I think the biggest hindrance happen. factor to change is this idea that there is no alternative. Yeah, yeah. Another interesting question from Lisanne online. Aren't you too optimistic about the role of governments? Politics is very much divided and it is heavily influenced by the big uh, agriculture industry. Science and bottom-up movements are the real forces for change. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. <laughs> Maybe it's also... Uh 
my hope, or maybe mm -hmm. it's more, I'm speaking more hopefully than. Um, yeah, I think there are two possible pathways, uh, and I, I do totally agree that we need this, uh, this force, this pressure from the bottom up. Um, absolutely, I mean that's also what I what I try to highlight with all these examples and the movements. Um, I've also seen that they they have uh, also made progress in in governance structures, so they can be successful. So mm -hmm. I I do have some optimism there, uh, and I do think it needs some coordination. Um, <laughs> But this kind of coordination could also be organized differently. And governance doesn't mean it has to be governance in the current system. So there's also this idea of the plural, pluriverse, for instance, uh, which is very much coming from, from the movement side, um, also like challenging growth for, so from degrowth movement, but also from Global South movements. Um, and pluriverse is basically the idea that you have all these different solutions all over the world and you connect them in a, in a broad network of alternatives. And that's kind of your governance system, <laughs> so it's very much bottom-up. Um, so th that's also a way to go. And um, yeah, but I'm not sure um, how we can break down these big power structures um, without also like support um, from the top down. Um, but yeah, I, I, yeah especially I, don't I think know. when you're marginalized, right? If you're already in a very vulnerable position, it's very difficult, I think, or even more difficult to really yeah. uh, change from bottom up. Yeah. So I think strategy-wise, I mean, I can't predict the future, future of course. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so it might not work. Um, so I do think it's helpful to, to pursue several strategies uh, and just wherever you are in the system, try to push for the changes that you can push for. And especially, as I said, connect to the others. I think that's, that's really the essential part, to connect to the others. And um, when thinking about what impact like small initiatives can have on a broader scale, I also always used to re like to refer to these paradigm shifts and which is connected to narratives, of course, discourses, mm -hmm. but is also implemented in, in different sets of institutions. And I would say, as long as you change these paradigms, you're, you're contributing to a transformation. So it doesn't matter how small you are, because you are, you are already living the change. Just make it known, basically. Um, so I do, do believe, especially in these paradigm time shifts, and I think when, when mindsets, so paradigm, paradigms could also, is also a word for, my, for, for mindsets, when mindsets change, um, we can have transformations also really quickly. Um, that's also what we see uh, in the past. So there, uh, in transformation research, um, we speak of leverage points for mm -hmm. change, uh, and these paradigms are considered as like the strongest leverage points. So it's, it's difficult to change them, especially in a, in a planned way. So you can identify what the current paradigms are, but you cannot really say um, what alternatives there will be because it emerges kind of from, <laughs> from mm -hmm. society. Yeah. Um, but yeah, by keeping this in mind, I think we can prevent a lot of co-option. And I think, I think co-option co by the current system is the biggest threat to transformation. Other questions in the audience? Yes. Um, I had a question regarding the role of maybe the university also in all of this. Um, Oops. Considering that a lot of research in agriculture is being done by the university as an institution and a lot of funding for that also comes from maybe a lot of multinationals. Would that yep. also be a point to address in terms of procedural justice and how do we address that also in this university setting right now? Yeah, that's, that's a really, really good question. Um, also one that I think everyone who is at the university and is trying to do research around these themes or trying to change something is struggling with, that we're always um, hindered also by the institutional structures because the current uh, the current scientific system, for instance, is very much focused on also growth. So, so the idea that we need to publish a lot, have a lot of output in terms of papers. Um, also, the way the way science is organized, very much focused on on single disciplines. That's a, for instance, at, at my institute, Copernicus Institute, I think that's a lot better than at a lot of other places because it's more interdisciplinary and encourages, um, yeah, tr transformative science uh, embraces this, also working together with stakeholders. So um, there are, also, are definitely some improvements already there. Um, I, I come from Germany where a lot of the, the chairs of professors are very disciplinary. So 
I think I, I have very strong doubts of solving the changes that we have uh, in a disciplinary manner. Uh, I think we need to look at the challenge that we are addressing and then think about what do we need to solve it basically, and not just the sci sci scientific um, act or like the scientists, but uh, together with, with the people that are, that are actually affected by the stakeholders. Uh, so I think that that is ex extremely important. Um, so beyond single disciplines. Um, beyond the scientific knowledge, as I said, um, bringing together different types of knowledge. Of course, we have a very, I mean, I'm also from, I'm also white, I'm also, uh, grew up in Germany in quite privileged position. Um, so it's also about acknowledging the privileges that, that we have and how we ourselves are contributing to the current system. Um, and, but doing our best with the privileges we have, I would say, to, to try to make the current system better <laughs> as, as much as we can. So I think it needs a different approach to science. Yes. So um, it seems that a lot of problems in the food system are deeply connected with the capitalist system. Uh, do you think we can solve that within this system or does the whole system need to change before we can actually solve uh, the, the, the problems in the food system? What do you mean by system? <laughs> the, so, so the cap, uh, capitalist system. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. The question, the reason I asked this is because I, I think there are a lot of different systems involved, different system dynamics. Uh, so, but um, yeah, I, I understand your point. Um, I think we can get started on a lot of things immediately, and uh, as all the alternatives uh, that we're already seeing are showing, um, you can already make change now. Um, and that's the only way to change now, <laughs> by doing it now, basically. And the system uh, is kind of made up of all the individual acts and the institutions and the narratives. So we are creating the system. And if we change ourselves, that's the first step to changing the system. And then, yeah, we need to go <laughs> bigger and bigger. And I guess uh, by building this alternative, well, that's kind of, I guess, my, my philosophy. Or if we, for instance, take this pro reverse idea, so so this network of alternatives, should if it eventually becomes strong enough to re replace the current system, so I think that's that's important that you become more and more independent from the capitalist system, <coughs> so you're not reinforcing it. Um, so we are very much acting within the current system, uh, and by every decision we make, we kind of reinforce it, uh, so strengthen it basically again. Uh, so that's really the difficulty in overcoming it, I would say, uh, and we are all, that's a problem that we all have. Um, but the more choices, I would say, the we make uh, trying to change it, um, yeah, the more likely we are to succeed, and the more, uh, basically, we, as I said, we need to link up, that's the, that's the key of it. Um, going a bit further in that same direction, actually, um, earlier you said that you didn't quite foresee uh, big companies like Monsanto um, being part of the change, as I understood it. Uh, but then how is your vision, because they still like have so massive impact on uh, global food production and by that also uh, on uh, uh, legislative law and stuff like that, um, um, what's your vision now? Is it like a battle against these uh, big companies or should we at some point like aim for uh, being cooperative with them uh, or they with like new movements uh, in order to make use of the leverage that they actually already have? Mm. I mean, you cannot treat every company the same, of course. Uh, so I think it's a little bit about maybe picking allies. Um, <laughs> uh, so of course, there are a lot of con companies, for instance, also like in conventional agriculture, I think there are a lot of actors that we can work together with or that uh, the movement can work, to work together with. Uh, and that's also important, like bridging, bridging these bina binaries. Uh, so that's especially from democracy perspective, because often um, actors also, yeah, uh, are they all, everyone is uh, under, under, under the structures that we're currently in and that prevents a lot of um, change. But when we're looking at these uh, huge companies that are controlling 23, also like, like Monsanto Bayer, or now, now Bayer, they're controlling 23% of the seed market. That it's, it's just not in their interest making this change. I mean, yeah, that's, that's what the whole, this whole um, idea of, of the current um, system 
and I mean, it's, it's becoming more and more the case. So like 10 years ago, it was basically 10 companies um, controlling, I think, 40% of the market, and now it's four. So this, 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 this trend is more and more increasing, and they are not going to give this up voluntarily. We need changes from governance, governance or we need pressure from below, or, or both. I think, I think it's both. I think we need to pressure. It's easier to, to affect the governments, governance structures, so I do think we need this pressure from below for the government then to intervene and break up these, uh, these companies. Um, so don't cooperate, but break them up. Yeah, right. Yep. They cannot. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? No, I thought I saw one. I think uh, that's <laughs> it then. Thank you. Again. But yeah, uh, there's yeah. a lot of uh, open questions. I certainly don't have all the answers. Um, it's also a lot about raising questions, bringing these justice issues to the core and or to, to the forefront, and thinking about them, uh, being critical about when you hear solutions, what does that actually mean? Yeah. I think that's the main main part. Thank you, Julia, and um, thank you all here in the audience again. Finally, I still want to ask you again to fill in or a short questionnaire, it's like taking 20 seconds. So please, if you can scan the QR code and let us know what you thought about it. Um, also, next week there are a lot of cool lectures, talk shows again from Studium Generale. There's one on autism on Monday in Tivoli Vredeburg. Um, check our website, sg.uu.nl, for everything that's happening. And for now, um, please, a final round of applause for Julia Chiazzi. Thank you.